And Prime. Now, as the world marked the World AIDS Day yesterday, the big, biggest question many asked was, where are we in the journey to finding a cure for the HIV virus tonight? I want to put that question to someone at the heart of the attempts to find a vaccine here in Kenya. Dr. Godensia Mutua is the clinical trials team leader at the Kenya AIDS Vaccine Initiative Institute of Clinical Research at the University of Nairobi. So much, uh, thank you so much for joining us in studio, Dr. But um, before we talk to on Dr. Masiko Reed about the mouse that have been made in combating HIV AIDS. Answer this one question for us. Are we ever going to find a vaccine for HIV? Well, thank you so much for having me. And um, I think I have to say categorically, we do believe that uh, a vaccine is possible. Uh -huh. um, if you look at uh, globally, uh, if I can just share with you some of the data. Uh, in 2009, uh, there was a study in Thailand, and that was the first indication that actually a vaccine was possible because um, the vaccine that was tested then showed about 30% efficacy. And so what we are doing right now is to try and improve on those findings. So we do believe that if we can improve the way the vaccine is designed, we improve the way it is delivered, we think that it is possible to actually have a vaccine. All right, we'll be talking about how much more uh, has been made. But let's first listen in to our medical correspondent, uh, Dr. Masi Corrido, on the milestones that have been made. She's on the other side of studio. Dr. Masi. Okay, so we've looked at four key areas where we think that the world has really made some progress in fighting this uh, HIV virus since the, the early 80s. And the first one is, well, on pre-exposure prophylaxis, which was launched uh, in the recent past. And this is for those who are at ongoing risk of acquiring the HIV infection. Now, this, the WHO considers, con is considering uh, expanding it to HIV negative mothers who are expectant uh, and or breastfeeding. Now, in addition to the pre-exposure prophylaxis, there is post-exposure prophylaxis, which are ARVs which are given within 72 hours of exposure, and these are for prevention purposes. Now, of importance to note is that post-exposure prophylaxis includes cancelling, uh, first aid if necessary, and HIV testing before administration of the post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, on treatment uh, on, on, uh, of HIV infection, the government this year launched uh, one of the treatments that are more tolerable and they can be used uh, once a day and have lower treatment discontinuation rates among users. Now, of note to note is that most of the antiretroviral uh, drugs that are used by the people who need them are used either twice a day or for a very long period of time. Now we have DTG or dolutegravir, which can be used once a day and low dose effavirenz, which are first line. Obviously, there are other list of second line uh, medications. Now, on trial is a long acting HIV injectable drug that the world is considering uh, introducing if it works. And it's currently in trial in sub Saharan Africa uh, among 3,200 women. And everyone is keen and watching to see if. Uh, this drug will uh, will uh, pass the trial phase and be introduced to the population because this will make really a big difference in treatment of HIV. Now, treatment as prevention. Studies have shown that once somebody adheres to their antiretroviral treatment re regimen as is prescribed, then they have like a 96% uh, there's a reduction by 96% of transmission of the HIV virus. Now, of importance to this is that it means the, the viral load of the people who are taking this medication will be reduced to a level where they are unlikely to transmit the virus. Now, of note here is that uh, antiretroviral therapy does not mean cure, but rather it suppresses uh, the viral replication in the body. Now, lastly, and we have uh, Dr. Mutua in studio to address this, is the issue of vaccines. Everyone has been talking about vaccines if there'll be a vaccine uh, against uh, HIV. And this has been proven a bit difficult to get because of the nature of the virus where it's really uh, variable and it's been really difficult for uh, researchers and uh, to get a vaccine that will actually work against HIV. Now of note is that in the last two days, there's been an introduction of an HIV vaccine trial in Southern Africa. And this is the second concurrent
current trial that is being done in Southern Africa to see if at all we'll be able to get any vaccine. Now, Dr. Godencia Mutua will be able to tell us where, as a country, we are in uh, trying to get a vaccine against HIV. Michelle. Right, many thanks. That is uh, Dr. Masi Korid. And here in studio with us is Dr. Godencia Mutua. So let's speak more about what uh, Dr. Masi Korid has been highlighting there. And uh, first on uh, was the issue of uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, commonly known as PrEP. And this has been seen as um, the new face of uh, HIV prevention, so to speak. Tell us more about how that has worked in combating HIV, especially in Kenya. Well, um, I have to say that uh, the PrEP, uh, the pre-exposure prophylaxis, is not a new concept. Mm -hmm. If you think, for instance, like, uh, you know, people will take anti-malarials before they travel or before they get infected. Right. So it's the same approach. So basically what we are encouraging people who are at elevated risk of HIV is uh, to use pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is basically drugs that would otherwise be used for treatment of HIV before they expose themselves. Uh -huh. So it's, it's, it is based on your own assessment of risk. It's not for everyone. Right. So for instance, if you look at discordant couples, for instance, those are people who would really benefit from uh, using pre-exposure prof prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'm sure there's been a lot of controversy regarding the use uh, of, uh, of PrEP as well, because uh, like you say, uh, you know, pre -ex exposure to risk depends on personal judgment as well. Um, there are those who have been said to misuse it, sex workers, for example, uh, taking it on a very um, you know, consistent basis just to prevent um, risky behavior, so to speak. So if you look at um, the guidelines that the government has given, you know, pre-exposure prophylaxis is supposed to go hand in hand with counseling, mm -hmm. adherence counseling, so that they use it as uh, is required, right. but also risk reduction counseling. Mm -hmm. So it's not supposed to be a replacement for the risk reduction counseling that really is important in reducing the, the risk of infection. Mm -hmm. uh, there was word from the uh, World Health Organization that this was to be expanded to HIV negative women. Why is that? Uh, again, you need to look at um, our epidemic. Yeah. Uh, if you look at our epidemic, even in Kenya. The HIV negative women who are expected, sorry. Uh, well, because, uh, I'm sorry, uh, HIV infected. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is a myth out there that uh, PrEP is also to be used uh, by women who are pregnant women who are HIV negative to reduce risks of trans transmitting uh, possible disease to the baby. Uh, well, the, what is available for HIV negative women mm -hmm. is pre-exposure prophylaxis. The, the treatment that is available for those who are positive is um, the prevention to, from mother to child. Right. So that's a different, that might be a different uh, angle. Mm -hmm. But for young women, we do know that um, uh, HIV among uh, women between 15 to 24 years, is the risk is extremely high. Right. So we are targeting such women uh, for, for prevention mm -hmm. if the, the lifestyle suggests that they require pre-exposure prophylaxis. All right. And of course, uh, when it comes to treatment, there is treatment also being used as prevention. So those who find themselves uh, HIV positive get themselves on treatment to prevent or reduce the risk of even uh, spreading the disease to others. How is this working, uh, especially in terms of access to medical care? Well, uh, like Masi has, has indicated, um, if you're on treatment and you're well controlled, then the risk uh, of transmission is reduced by 96%. Right. So what government has, um, has now moved forward with is to really say that people need to be started on treatment when they're diagnosed. And that's different from the previous uh, guidelines mm -hmm. where we used to wait until a certain cutoff, in which case, you know, we would wait until the immune system has reduced. But right now we're saying it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Immediately you are diagnosed, start treatment. Because there is a long period of uh, waiting when people were waiting until CD4s would go down. That was a period when people were transmitting the virus. Mm -hmm. So if we can reduce uh, the number of people who are infective, and we, if we can really control viruses for those who are on treatment, then we are saying that the risk of transmission is almost zero. Right, right. Now, some say I mean, it can reduce the risk of transmission by about 96%, but information is power, and sometimes you can also get that information mixed up. So let's talk about um, a discordant couple, for example, one who is HIV positive, knows it very well, and is on medication that would reduce his risk of uh, transmitting the disease. But his uh, partner, who's, who is HIV negative, is not on any prevention measure. Is that 
is, is that acceptable, you know, for somebody to say, I'm HIV positive, but I'm on medications, I will not transmit the disease to you? Or does one also need to have their own personal prevention measures? So what we're saying is that um, for the period of about six months from the time you start treatment, mm -hmm. then we do recommend that for the negative partner, they should actually be on PrEP. Mm -hmm. We estimate that within six months, uh, that the person, if they're taking drugs consistently, and they should have reduced their viruses to almost zero, uh -huh. or at least undetect undetectable levels. Right. So um, there is a period of risk when you're initiating treatment, and that is a period when we en encourage the negative partner uh -huh. to actually be on PrEP. Right. But after that season of risk, then they can move forward and just have the person regularly be tested and to make sure that the viral loads are actually below undetectable levels. Right. And of course, there's a lot of trial vaccines uh, that uh, have been in, in, in the offing, uh, but among the most um I would say the most successful measures of prevention has been the mother-to-child prevention of HIV. And Kenya has seen a lot of milestones in that. How far have we come? I think we've done very well indeed uh, because previously, you know, we used to have just a single drug uh, for uh, preventing mother-to-child. But right now we are saying that if you're, on, if, if you're pregnant, you continue with your antiretrovirals. And we're basically reducing, again, the risk of transmitting to the child to almost zero. Uh -huh. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's really a different... Um, uh, playing field for those of us who have been in the field for more than 20 years mm -hmm. to see the difference that it, it has made in terms of the expectation of having a normal uninfected baby. All right, all right. And of course, it's always said it's, all, it's always better uh, to be safe than sorry. And uh, condom use has been propagated one of the best, may, uh, best means, if not abstinence, of uh, preventing HIV. But there are other um, new means that are coming up. And uh, the, uh, I'm not quite sure of the name, microbicides or microbicides. Talk to us about that. These are gels or creams that can be used before sexual intercourse that would reduce the risk of transmission. What are they? So microbicides are basically products that are used at the point of sexual contact. Uh -huh. And that's why they're used um, in the female genital tract. And occasionally also there, there are some that are being prepared for, for use in the anal uh -huh. and the rectum. So basically they are gels that can either offer a mechanical barrier but uh, more recently, uh, the kind of research that we are doing uh, is is for for rings that within that ring we have incorporated an antiretroviral drug. Right. So we actually have an antiretroviral drug at the first point of contact to really uh, destroy or damage the, the the virus, so you don't get the transmission. Uh -huh. um, they're used. At the, at, they're used. You know before or after sex, depending on the formulation. But uh, the, the, the research right now is heading towards more long-acting antiretrovirals so that you actually have it in place mm -hmm. for a longer period of time. You don't have, it, it doesn't have to be uh, directly related to sexual activity. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things that has been a challenge is adherence. If you have a product that you have to insert when you expect sex, right. um, it hasn't been very easy uh, for people to anticipate when they're going to have sexual mm -hmm. intercourse. And so we're moving towards products that can actually stay within the genital system so that regardless of, of, of your life circumstances, it is there to protect you. Right. And, um, and maybe just to add to that, we're also looking at products that can do several things. For instance, we're looking at products that in addition to preventing HIV can also prevent pregnancy. Mm -hmm can also uh, prevent other STIs, mm -hmm. sexually transmitted infections, so right. that a woman doesn't need to use three different products. We can have one product that actually addresses all the three needs. All right, so those are uh, good measures in terms of combating HIV. And of course, we keep very optimistic that there will be a possible cure or possible vaccine in the near future. Many thanks for speaking to us. That is uh, Dr. Godensia Mutua, who is a principal investigator at the Kavi Institute of Clinical Research, bringing us to our second break here on KTN Weekend Prime. Stay with us. Still to come, Health Digest and other news making headlines.